Welcome to We Rise, your radio show devoted to igniting imaginations in the service of collective liberation. This is Kat Petru, and you are listening online or at 89.3 FM KPFB in Berkeley, which is occupied Ohlone territory known as Huchin. On today's show, we focus on another occupied land, Boriquen, or Puerto Rico, as it was named by Spanish colonizers. As you well know, the people of Boriquen have been facing monumental challenges escalated by recent hurricanes. Your guest host for the hour, Laura Chegaray, Boricua hurricane survivor and apprentice with KPFA's First Voice Apprenticeship Program, examines disaster capitalism and what on earth it has to do with surviving this and future alleged natural disasters. She'll speak with incredible guests on these subjects. You'll be hearing a rebroadcast of her show Full Circle from Friday, November 17th. For more information, please check out kpfaapprentice.org or mixcloud.com backslash we rise radio. Here is Full Circle. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Full Circle, your cultural affairs radio magazine produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. This show was written, produced, and recorded in Wichin, Occupy Ohlone territory, also known to settlers as the East Bay. Tonight, we will talk about Puerto Rico or Borinquen, the island's indigenous name. We will discuss its social and political situation, how we got where we are, and what's next. On tonight's shows, we will learn important historical facts about the relationship between the U.S. government and Puerto Rico. We will go over the concept of disaster capitalism as defined by Naomi Klein in her 2007 book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, and why is it important to understand Borinquen's situation. We will speak with Defend Puerto Rico's activist Khalil Jacobs Fantausi about how disaster capitalism has been manifested by the powers at play. We will learn about what's happening at the University of Puerto Rico and how organizations in the island are responding to the crisis. All that tonight on Full Circle. I am your host and Hurricane Maria survivor, Laura Laborico Echegaray. Stay with us. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to Full Circle. Back on September 6, Hurricane Irma hit Puerto Rico, and a few days after, I went there to help my family recover. I've been through several hurricanes in my life, so I was okay to be without electricity for a week or so. And I was, but no previous experience prepared me for what came next. Nearly Category 5 Hurricane Maria. Have you seen the pictures? For me, the scariest part was in the wind. Picture this. Phones would not work, so you can't call an ambulance or police. Internet is down, so my parents couldn't get their prescriptions filled or use an ATM to get cash for food, water, or anything. Roads were blocked or destroyed, so it will take inordinate amounts of time to get from A to B, if at all possible. It was as if we were living in the 1800s, except that in those times, people knew how to operate things manually. What worries me sick is that this misery is still increasing as time goes by. So much that almost 100,000 people have left the island since September 20. My parents are still there. So are my two brothers, my many cousins, and their families. It is really heart-wrenching to know what they deal with and not be able to do that much about it. In fact, today is my father's 83rd birthday, and I'm hoping he can listen to the show I worked so hard to produce because he just got electricity connected 56 days after Maria. Well, if you can hear me, papi, feliz cumpleaños. Te quiero mucho. This show is dedicated to you, Jose Francisco Chegaray, and your exemplary dedication to Puerto Rico's dignity and independence. Borinquen thanks you for your amazing art, 
your poetry and your pioneer work against the mining companies in our beautiful mountains. Now, according to Economist YouGov survey, only 47% of the U.S. mainland population knows that Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. How many of you know that Borinquen had been in the U.S. expansion plans long before 1998? Let's listen to Apprentice Group 43 and Puerto Rican Luis Burguillo's piece about this important part of history. I'm becoming an American citizen, a history of denied promises and American imperial colonialism. In 1898, Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Virgin Islands, and the Philippines became United States acquired territories under the Treaty of Paris as a result of the American plan Spanish-American War. Since 1894, the United States Naval War College had been formulating plans for war with Spain, and by 1896, the Office of Naval Intelligence prepared for war, which included military operations off the coast of Puerto Rico. In 1890, Captain Alfred Thayer Mann, the president of the United States Naval War College and a member of the Navy War Board, and leading United States strategist wrote his thesis that argued for organizing a world-class Navy modeled after the British Royal Navy. Part of the strategy of his work, the influence of sea power upon history, was the acquisition of colonies in the Caribbean. These colonies would serve as fuel stations and naval stations, as strategic points of defense. In addition to the Caribbean islands, the fuel stations and strategic defense bases will include Panama Canal, Pearl Harbor, Wake Island, Midway Island, and the Philippines in the Pacific Ocean, revealing the United States Naval Pacific National Policy. Spain set up Puerto Rico to produce cattle, sugarcane, coffee, and tobacco, brought about the need to import African slaves. As a result, Puerto Ricans will become the inheritors of the term the blood of mankind flows in me as an illustration of their Taino and Caribe indigenous roots together with an amalgam of Spanish and African bloodlines. In fairly rapid succession, the United States Congress passed legislation solidifying its control over its newly acquired colonial naval stations. First was the Foraker Act of 1900, which laid out the political, economic, and fiscal relationship with the United States. The second act of major significance was the jones shafroff Act, which was signed into law by the segregationist United States President Woodrow Wilson in 1917. This act imposed United States citizenship on the island's population and also imposed English as the island's official language. Ironically, in 1917, was the year that the United States would enter World War I and was in need of cannon fodder. Consequently, as United States citizens, Puerto Ricans could join the United States Army. However, few chose to do so. With widespread concern and opposition in the United States over its lurking involvement in the problems of Europe and waging war, Wilson signed into law compulsory military service. As a result, in less than two months of becoming United States citizens, 20,000 Puerto Ricans were drafted to serve in World War I. These 20,000 recent imposed United States citizen draftees will serve to guard the newly constructed Panama Canal, an important commercial and military waterway for the United States and its international and foreign domination policy. Puerto Rican U.S. citizens will go to serve in significant numbers in America's wars, police actions, and military campaigns ever since, including the 396th Infantry Regiment from New York City known as the Harlem Hellfighters, that served in the Western Front in World War II. By the beginning of World War I, Puerto Rico became an important military, naval, and army base of operations, serving its interests in the Caribbean Basin, Central and South America. Currently, Puerto Rico is a major tourist destination, leading pharmaceutical, manufacturing, and financial center for the Caribbean. This has been Luis Bulguillo for Full Circle. Welcome back to Full Circle on 94.1 FM. Thanks to Luis Burguillo for such a lightning work. We're talking about Borinquen, commonly referred to as Puerto Rico, and the connection to something called disaster capitalism. 
Right before I went to Puerto Rico, I was working on a full circle show about Chile's 1973 presidential coup. By the way, you can still listen to it at kpfaapprentice.org. So in preparation for that show, I researched into Naomi Klein's shock doctrine and disaster capitalism concepts. Her work really helped me make sense of the current events in Puerto Rico and I think most of the major conflicts in the world. Naomi Klein is an award-winning journalist, syndicated columnist, and author of the international bestsellers This Changed Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate in 2014, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism in 2007, and her most recent work, No is Not Enough, Resisting Trump's Shock Politics and Winning the World We Need. I highly recommend you look her up. There are plenty of videos on YouTube, such as this one I'm going to play for you. And when we come back, we're going to talk about with Khalid Jacobs, Fanta Uzi, member of Defend Puerto Rico, and we'll discuss Puerto Rico's situation in the light of Naomi Klein's work. Take a listen. Well... First of all, I don't think it is conspiratorial. I think it's a, it's a basic principle of journalism to follow the money. And we have conflict of interest rules precisely because people are human. And when you can benefit personally, economically, from policies that you are advancing, then those policies are called into question. But to me, it's a broader question about what I call the disaster capitalism complex. I think that there's a particular way of thinking that comes with being in the business of disaster. And I'm not talking about just any old economic holdings, right? I'm talking about those particular economic holdings you know, whose fortunes increase when things go bad, right? So oil and gas. Um, bad things happen, the price of oil goes up. This we know, right? Whether it is a hurricane, a war, whether it's a fear of a war, whether it's Chavez and Ahmadinejad hugging, whatever it is, bad price of oil goes up, right? And the same is true for defense stocks, homeland security stocks. The same is true for drug companies that are in the business of pandemics. So this is how I'm defining broadly the disaster capitalism complex, which is bigger than the military industrial complex. The reason why Eisenhower warned, uh, gave that famous warning in his last presidential address about the danger of the military industrial complex is precisely because this is an industry that has an economic incentive for war and instability. So I think that there is something really significant that we need to talk about in that the people who've been running the government in Washington, but also the occupation of Iraq, are card-carrying members of the disaster capitalism complex. I don't think it sounds conspiratorial. I think it sounds obvious, right? I'm, in fact, embarrassed to be pointing this out because it's such an obvious point. But it amazes me that people don't talk about it all the time, or that Dick Cheney was in the business of privatizing the U.S. military before he went into office, that Donald Rumsfeld was in the business of profiting from pandemics before he went into office, that Bush was in the oil and gas business before he came into office, that his father was connected to the Carlisle Group, which is a major weapons dealer, um, that Paul Bremer, the chief envoy in Iraq who laid the economic framework for the occupation, that one month after September 11th, he launched a homeland security company to advise other corporations on how they could protect themselves in this new era, that Rudy Giuliani did the same thing three months later. So these are all people who see profit directly from terrorism, natural disasters, and pandemics. What is their economic incentive to get us off this disastrous course? I mean, we need political leaders who think disasters are bad. <laughs> you know, I mean, that to me is a good starting premise. That was the voice of Naomi Klein with a brief description of the concepts in her book. We'll have a link to her work on our website, kpfaapprentice.org. And to find out how this is manifesting in Borinquen, I interviewed Khalil Jacobs Fantauzi. Khalil is a spokesperson for Defend Puerto Rico, former mayor of Berkeley candidate, and a longtime supporter of KPFA. He starts with his thoughts on disaster capitalism and Puerto Rico. Well, I think that the idea of disaster capitalism 
it can't be stated any more clear when it comes to the history of Puerto Rico and what's currently going on in Puerto Rico. We have an island that was invaded by the United States, 1898, July 25th, and the town of Juanica. Without the consent of the people, we have a military government that was established. The first thing they did was take over the system of education. So from the very beginning, the relationship of the United States to Puerto Rico was one in which it existed purely and solely for gaining the most wealth as possible. And so when we look at capitalism and the idea of making money off of people, um, the island of Puerto Rico is a, a perfect example for that. With the disaster of Hurricane Maria, I think it kind of enhanced all of those past relationships and it brought it to a situation where people are currently dying, are not able to drink clean water, are not able to live their lives. And that's when people take advantage the most. Just to go back a little bit, pre-Hurricane Maria, we were already in a big crisis. Yeah, I like to look at it as a history of leaders who refused to pay their debt going back. So from the Spanish taking the land of the Tainos, from the U.S. taking the land of Puerto Rico, refusing to pay the colonial debts that were due back then. And then we look at World War I and we look at the jones Sheroff Act of 1917, where Puerto Ricans were given United States citizenship and at the same time, there was World War I, in which 20,000 Puerto Rican soldiers were drafted to fight at war. And it also, a lot of people don't know, that it gave the triple tax exemption for bondholders, regardless of where the bondholder resided. That means that they didn't have to pay federal tax, state tax, or local tax on bonds. And that dates back all the way to 1917. Wow. Yes, and there was a lot of things that happened to bring United States manufacturers to come to the island where they gave them tax loopholes. That started in 1976. They had recruited big companies and corporations to come set up their manufacturing companies in Puerto Rico. A lot of pharmaceuticals came, and we saw companies get really wealthy and rich. And as a result of the wealth being brought to the island, Puerto Rico experienced some of those benefits economically. And then in 1996 to 2006, they realized that the United States was losing money. The elimination of the tax loopholes would give the United States Treasury $10.5 billion over the next 10 years. So when they closed these tax loopholes and they made it so that the people would have to pay the taxes that they should, these companies actually left and that really is what started the major downfall in terms of the economic situation. So a lot of people started leaving the country. I think we lost half a million ever since 1996. That's correct. So the jobs left. There was a complete brain drain in terms of people that were making higher wage living. So there was no taxable incomes. Um, it's also important to recognize that Puerto Rico has one of the largest underground communities and businesses as well in terms of people that don't have established jobs not being taxed. And then you have this exodus of people where people are leaving the island looking for work and to survive. Yep. I can cite my own son who graduated as an electrical engineer and searched and searched for over a year and eventually had to leave. He's living in Florida now. I don't like it. It's our reality yeah. as a Puerto Rican people. So do you have any idea of who is getting rich or richer with this situation? Well, I think that the narrative is told that there's a lot of small independent people that are the bondholders of the large majority of Puerto Rican debt. But upon doing research, you find out that it's actually a lot of large businesses and, and wealthy individuals that own the majority of Puerto Rican debt. A lot of it was hidden and they were refusing to release the information in terms of the actual businesses and individuals that own the bonds. But as people have been doing research, we know that they are a part of vulture funds and hedge funds who bought the debt at a very reduced rate and then increased the interest rates. And we also know that they charge exuberant fees for these. So a huge part of the debt of Puerto Rico is actually interest and fees that were charged. 
I think it's almost half of it. No, it's like That's thirty-three billion dollars in just interest. Yeah, and we're talking about something that's been going on for decades now. So the history of what has happened in Puerto Rico hasn't been coming to the surface, and all of a sudden it was front page news. We definitely uh, have to appreciate the fact that we're talking about the need for Puerto Rican sovereignty, independence, and a future of Puerto Rico that does not look like the past. Yeah. Tell me a little bit how Puerto Ricans are paying for this. Well, in 2016, President Obama signed a law called the PROMESA, the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Income Stability Committee. Um, It's a federal advisory board that was completely appointed not at all elected and doesn't really represent Puerto Rico or Puerto Ricans. And they started to make decisions, um, whether it was the closing of over 150 schools, whether it was the closing of, of hospitals, the idea of selling private lands, whether it was the idea of reducing minimum wage so that Puerto Rico can start paying back this enormous debt. That was kind of what was awakening the people in terms of people starting to resist, taking to the streets, protesting. The first actual meeting of the board that was in Condado was not able to happen as a result of the protesters outside. Um, So it was really getting people agitated and angry and wanting to do something about the situation. And we talk about it as an afterthought when we're looking at the situation of life and debt and life and death as well. But it's it's a situation that's going to affect the future of Puerto Rico. And when we're looking at how to address the issues of Hurricane Maria, we're going to have to address the issues of the debt in Puerto Rico. As of today, I think the death toll is over 900 people and doctors have been leaving the island even before the hurricane. I remember very well when my father told me that his doctor asked him to go visit him in Florida. My father just came out of cancer surgery. Wow. That was my guest, Khalil Jacobs Fantauzi. We're going to take a music break, and when we return, we'll continue our conversation.
Borinquen Se Levanta by Hernán Olivera and Jova Rodríguez, one of a long list of new songs Puerto Ricans have composed after Hurricane Maria. We have been talking to Khalil Jacobs Fantausi about Borinquen or Puerto Rico and what is happening at this point. Let's now listen to part two of the interview. Here we start the conversation on the topic of climate migration out of Puerto Rico. So... We know that there's a mass exodus of Puerto Ricans post-Hurricane Maria, that there's almost like 5,000 people leaving a week. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that the death tolls don't really take into consideration uh, what's to come. And we know that there's waterborne infections that are uh, creating a higher death toll because of different diseases that are found as people continue to drink off of streams and rivers and contaminated wells. And these things are going to be seen in the future. We don't even know the type of atrocity that we're facing, as well as the elderly in the hospitals not having electricity so that people can't get their medications and are not able to use the machines that are necessary for people to survive. Personally, a lot of the elders in my family have left the island because they haven't been able to get the medication that they need to live. Yep. My mom needs insulin refrigerated, so there was a big ordeal getting the gasoline just to power the generator to power the fridge. Yeah, and I think it's such a shame that people think that the death toll could have possibly been 15 or 16. The reality is that it's a much, much larger figure. It's much larger, and it's after the hearing, and maybe it was 15 people knocked out by the wind and the landslides, but after the hearing, and that's when things got really, really ugly. So I'm thinking, how do we gather support for this political situation of Puerto Rico? Because all these calamities are the result of inequality that has been happening since... 119 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, there's a lot of ways that we can stand up and apply pressure and have a voice. I think it's times like this where it's critical, not just for Puerto Ricans, but people who want justice and want to support the situation of Puerto Ricans. We actually have created a campaign for people to get involved. So if you go to www.defendpr.com, slash action it will take you to a website where you put your zip code in it will automate a letter addressing it to all your local congressional representatives talking about the issues in puerto rico 
We also know that even people here in local Bay Area politics, I sat down with um, Cheryl Davila, who is a Council 2 representative, to talk about how we could pass some legislation, some things at city council level that amplify what's going on and that pressure the Congress to take action. So I think that it needs to happen at every level, not just um, one. There's another push to do a waiver for the Jones Act. Yes, maybe people are confused. There are two different Jones Acts that both affect Puerto Rico that were made by two different people. The Jones Act of 1920 or the Maritime Act is the act that mandates ships that are coming from foreign territories to stop in a port that is in the United States and is owned by the a United States vessel. And then it comes back to Puerto Rico, and that creates a huge increase in the cost, and that's been happening for a long time. And when we looked at how different countries, particularly Cuba and Venezuela, other countries that wanted to support post-Hurricane Maria, they weren't allowed to send ships with personnel or with humanitarian aid directly to Puerto Rico as a result of the Jones Act. There's a lot of help just sitting at the ports in Florida. Private companies are deciding what goes into Puerto Rico. Not FEMA, not even the people who care are the ones who are deciding what goes in Puerto Rico at this point. Yeah, and I think that there's even help that has arrived in Puerto Rico that yet has not reached the people that live in the mountainous areas where the roads have been cut off, where the bridges have collapsed. And it's ridiculous because they have access to other ways. They have helicopters. They may cost more, but they're there. And we want to see the aid get to the people who need it. Which brings me to the point, why do you think that the help is not getting where it's supposed to go? Could it be that they want people to give up and leave the country? Why would they want people to leave the country? For me, I think that there is an interest. There's such a huge value of the real estate of Puerto Rico. Historically, They've set up United States naval bases there because of its proximity to other countries in Latin America that we wanted to have access to in terms of military. It is some of the most beautiful land in the world in terms of being on beaches and, and having natural beauty. So I definitely feel that there are people who have money who want to invest in Puerto Rico. The easiest way to invest and get things for cheap is to not have people be there. So the mass exodus of Puerto Ricans leaving the island is playing in in their favor. And I think that there is a lack of humanity in terms of looking at the effects of this slow distribution of aid, the effects of people not having running water. And I think that in this society, we're so used to news being of importance only for a day or two, and then it move on to the next news story that unfortunately Puerto Rico's not even being talked about or the situations that's affecting people that are living without roofs or living in areas that lost absolutely everything are no longer top stories. We can't forget about those stories. I keep reading Facebook and absorbing all this terrible news. Just read about mold taking over the houses of people because they don't have roofs. And I heard that cleaning supplies and Clorox and bleach and different things are very hard to access, are not accessible. But I think it's important for us not to think about only the negative implications of Hurricane Maria. I think that any time there's a natural catastrophe or one that is a result of climate change like that we see here, there's a future that can be created. And this is an opportunity for us to not rebuild some of the same challenges and problems and really create a vision for our island and for the people of Puerto Rico that is different than the one of the past. There was a collective of journalists that went down to Puerto Rico, hashtag PR on the map by Rosa Clemente. My brother was a part of that delegation. And they were able to see amazing acts of resilience and resistance and people supporting each other and people um, living without so that their neighbor could have something. And in the Bay Area, there's been a huge response in terms of Puerto Rican organizations coming together, protests in front of the federal building. There's been an outcry of people who want to do something and have make sure that Puerto Rico is not forgotten and that people are aware of what's happening on the island.
That's a great point to make because now we're going to talk about autonomous responses in Puerto Rico and how they're trying to rebuild the way that benefit most to the Boricuas over there. Thank you, Khalil. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate you taking the time to allow these stories to be told and this history to be shared. There's so much to learn. Every time I go online to prepare for an interview or to learn about what's happening, there's constant news and there's different things that, that are happening that we need to be kept abreast. So thank you very much for, for this show. Yeah, we will have all those links in our page, uh, kpfaapprentice.org. That's kpfaapprentice.org. And we'll also have links to where to donate to those organizations that are doing the hard work. Yes, so it's it's important that we don't just think about the Red Cross and wait for FEMA to get the aid when we know that we have the power to do something about it ourselves. So let's do that. Yes. That was the voice of Khalil Jacobs Fantausi of Defend Puerto Rico. And you can go to his page is defendpuertorico.com to learn more and take action. And speaking of actions, you're invited to Sunday, November 19, from 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. Our own Avacha presents a family affair with great music poetry, and Puerto Rican food happening at Joffrey's Inner Circle, 410 14th Street in Oakland. Check kpfaapprentice.org for more information. Let's take another break, this time for a dose of freshly written poetry that captures the emotional toll on Boricuas here and there. We fly to your protection, most holy mother. Please listen to our petitions and needs. And deliver us from all danger, ever glorious and blessed, Maria. Las Marias. It was the winds, terror winds, creeping incognito, signed in as sacred mother to fool the faithful. Not just winds, monster gales, twisting communication towers with bare hands, turning shutters meant to protect into projectiles, undoing Wahataka Dam. It must have been the winds that turned that line that divides the living from the dead into crepe paper ribbons spiraling high overhead. That brutal wind raged, stomped so hard, Boricua spinning in the air didn't know on which side of the line they would land. When the winds calmed, we in the diaspora dropped pebbles in rising waters. But there were no ripples. We strained to hear through throbbing silence, but not even the coquis sang. Querida Isla, ¿estás allá? Háblame, por favor. ¿Qué me contestas? Algo, algo, por favor, por favor. We gathered to wait, embraces lingering, holding one another, even if we didn't know each other's names. Drums pulsing like heartbeats broke the silence. The subidor sang our supplications. Bomba dancers in prayerful trance, piqueteando, whirling skirts chased storm clouds in Maria's wake. A crescendo of voices, claves and drums pounded fervent, please. And then I saw you across the room. It must have been the wind and that broken border between the breathing and the dead that brought you back to me, although your ashes swirl in the air above Aguadilla ten years now. Dapper as ever in a white guayabera, a gentle wind caressed your thick, dark hair. I longed to touch your sepia skin across the expanse. I watched your hands dance, make the cuero sing, passion vivid as a flamboyan. For a sweet moment, I indulged in reminiscence, rambled with you amid calm winds in Santurce, Utuavo, Piñones, Arecibo, El Nuque, Corozal, till you told of the tempest that shattered these places, of red earth flowing like rivers of blood. I asked who the winds had taken. 
your eyes darkened with sorrow. Ay, muertos. But brightened, relating that our family had survived, hands held high amid fallen palms. I cast improbable appeals to the heavens on autumn winds, but you disappeared like ocean mist. My tears fell in ripples of loss, some fresh, some time-worn, some still unfolding, as the Barilis played a mournful guimbe. Somewhere in between Africa, Espanilla, the Arawak, mi Taino from Cuba to Panama. Dance, dance, de pasito Harlem shake, mi guaguanco. It's the same in every language, Bugalu, Willy, Colón. Are we too black to be Latin and too Latin to be black? We are everything and nothing. We can't stay, we can't go back. To Havana, the Dominican Republic, or San Juan. Cause the politics are heavy, they can't call us either one. And I see you got a santo, but you ain't no babalao. So I sip on manzanilla carefree, I hold it down. Dance, dance, bomba plena, play my cuatro just like huelo. In between another language could be hola, could be hello. Melo mommy can't be bothered, I know my identity. But they call me pelo malo, prieta loud as a coqui. Café con leche for breakfast, you walk around with too much soul. Cause she's somewhere in between, calle luna, calle sol, dale. That was the poetry of Susana Proverb Perez, and we just heard Ginger Cuevas with her lively rap about being an Afroboricua. Welcome back to Full Circle on KPFA 94.1 FM. This program could not be complete without the voice of Puerto Ricans who are living in Puerto Rico right now. Communications are still difficult, but I was able to contact emerging journalist Ana Pornoy Brimmer. She's a graduate student at the University of Puerto Rico, my alma mater. Here is what she had to say about what's happening there. I am a master's student in literature at the University of Puerto Rico, um, mm -hmm. and I'm a writer and a poet. Currently, I'm a contributing writer with Global Voices, which is an alternative online platform. And basically what I've been doing is to try to make sense of well, the colonial humanitarian crisis that's taking place. I've been trying to write my way through it, and I've been trying to visualize the situation here in Puerto Rico, which has not received up until recently the necessary media attention that it deserves. So that's what I've been trying to do. That's my activism on the page. What have you seen in terms of this disaster capitalism playing out around you? What we've been seeing, obviously, are the attempts to privatize PREPA, that's Puerto Rico's power authority. And there's been a lot of talk around that, especially regarding the questionable contracts, Whitefish and Cobra. But I think what hasn't been talked about, and it's definitely under threat now, is the University of Puerto Rico because the University of Puerto Rico is at a greater risk than before of falling victim to the perils of disaster capitalism and having pro-corporate measures characteristic of the shock doctrine shoved down its throat. And after Hurricane Maria's passing, UPR found itself in a terrible pickle, even more complicated than the one it was in before the hurricanes, which was bad enough, right, when the Fiscal Control Board came in and tried to establish these austerity measures and implemented horrible draconian budget cuts and tuition spikes and horrible conditions for a uh, adjunct professorship. And the university basically found itself having to make a very complicated decision right now. On the one hand, UPR could decide not to continue with the semester because proper recovery and reconstruction would require an extensive amount of time. But watch as a portion of its students was going to be snatched away by universities and colleges on the island. But on the other hand, UPR could decide to reopen, which it did, but watch a portion of its student body leave or not return anyways due to the fact that the university hasn't been fully and properly rehabilitated to serve its student body, faculty or staff, and that the reality of Puerto Rico is not compatible with the normality the university is trying to craft and establish. And so those decisions have serious repercussions. And the university is in a horribly vulnerable state right now at the hands of the Fiscal Control Board and the central government who are trying to privatize all of our public entities in Puerto Rico. We know that they're being attacking public schools. What do you know about that? I do know that teachers have been protesting 
to reopen their schools. They want students to be able to return to receiving education. Teachers have been getting arrested for protesting, and this is taking place due to the fact that prior to the hurricanes, during the big social movements that were starting to arise due to the Fiscal Control Board's arrival to Puerto Rico, protesting was criminalized here in Puerto Rico. So a lot of our rights regarding freedom of speech and being able to protest about the injustices taking place were taken away from us. And it's not surprising that they're arresting these teachers on the street. It's infuriating, right? And what I also know is that just like the University of Puerto Rico is under threat of being privatized, so is primary and secondary public education. Prior to the hurricanes, a lot of schools were being closed down. A lot of students and teachers were being relocated to other schools very far away from their towns as well. And after the hurricane, a lot of students, they left Puerto Rico to the United States as part of the massive exodus post-Hurricane Maria. Yeah, we know that a lot of people have been leaving the island, but the Fiscal Control Board is using that as an excuse to close even more schools. Absolutely. That's exactly the plan. They want people to leave. They want the land for themselves, and they want to continue to privatize and to make profits off the island. And how's life in Puerto Rico in these days? Recovering has been very, very, very slow and concerted, I believe, especially in the center of the island. People are still recurring to rivers, creeks and springs, to bathe, to gather water, to drink. I mean, some people don't even have the proper resources to boil the water or filter the water or purify it. So people are drinking it straight from these bodies of water. Um, people don't have power. A lot of supermarkets are still depleted of supplies. Provisions are still taking a long time to make it to certain regions on the island. The horrible health crisis is ensuing. A lot of hospitals are still running on generators. Things are bad in Puerto Rico right now. How can we support Well, apart from everything that Diaspora has already been doing, right, which has been organizing amazing initiatives to raise funds and to gather provisions and send them over, I think a really big and important way to contribute to the situation on the island right now is to continue to help us visibilize the situation in Puerto Rico and not only the humanitarian crisis taking place, but the debt crisis that came prior to the hurricanes and which has worsened after hurricanes Irma and Maria. So I think calling your local representatives and pushing for disaster relief, not loans, but grants, and also for debt elimination, that's a really critical way to help. That was Puerto Rican Ana Portnoy Brimmer here on Full Circle KPFA 94.1 FM. We're going to have links to her work, all these organizations and ways for you to get involved in our apprentice page, kpfaapprentice.org. Last but not least, we will hear from Vilma Gonzalez Castro and the phenomenal and devout response of the Puerto Rico Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Coordinadora Paz para la Mujer, also known as the Puerto Rico Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. We are a 35-member coalition with a multi-program island-wide network of representatives from rural and metropolitan areas and is comprised of shelters, service providers, legal advocates, researchers, feminists, and human rights activists dealing with issues of violence against women, especially with intimate partner violence and sexual assault in Puerto Rico. So our organization supports other organizations that provide direct services to women in Puerto Rico under children and better women and survivors of sexual assault. And what kinds of services do these organizations provide? We have emergency shelter for survivors of domestic violence. We have non-residential programs. We also work with university programs that work with gender issues and human rights organizations. I see. How the satellite organizations have been responding to this? I think that it's important to remember that Puerto Rico was already struggling with economic recession in the last 10 years. A billionaire debt and the establish of the fiscal control board. In other words, before the hurricanes, 
Irma and Maria, the programs and organization also were confronting a lot of economic problems. But after the hurricane, we confronted a more challenging situation and basic needs such as access to water, food, electricity, communication, the collapse of hospitals create a very critical situation. We are experiencing an increase in cases of gender violence and sexual assault, and the resources that we have available to attend were affected, and some of them had to close operations. 911 emergency lines were collapsed due to the serious problem with communications. So we try to respond immediately to the crisis. First, we try to identify the needs of the organizations and supporting them in resolving the very basic needs. For example, we need to find generators, food, water, diesel, that kind of things. We immediately have to open a, a collection center when we start to receive essential items that have been distributed to the organizations because the response of the government was very, very slow. So we need to resolve that immediately because people cannot wait. So another thing that we made was to coordinate health and support services, establishing what we call a health route and that's in collaboration with the nursing school of the University of Puerto Rico and the Carlos Albizo University. Basic physical and mental health services are provided with the support of the psychologists and the nurses from the universities. We, this month, we also began what we call the Purple Caravan, which is a collaboration with different organizations and universities, and we are taking in mobile units with services of gynecology, pediatrics, legal orientation, helping people follow up with FEMA and protection orders. We have services of acupuncture because there is a huge need to work with the very immediate things such as food and water, but also with the trauma you know, with the people that experience this catastrophic hurricane. Each week we are visiting different towns in the island and bringing services to the more disadvantaged community. And we also carry food and water and we distribute. We also create a respite line for the people who work in the organization. Many times we forgot that those who are responding to the crisis are also living it no longer in a vicarious but primary way and we are also having debriefing groups to process this traumatic experience the idea is to meet the needs in a holistic and integrated way that sounds wonderful it's a lot of work i'm sure it is wow but it's also I'm you so know impressed. what for me, one of the things that is amazing is all the solidarity that we receive from the people in here, but also from the people in the diaspora, which is very important for us in this moment. Well, I thank you for the work you do. It sounds really, really amazing. How can we support you? Well, we have created also initiatives to support the work that we are doing. So we have PayPal account in our website is www.pasparalamujer.org and we have the Hurricane Maria Relief Fund and with the contributions that we received through this fund we have been supporting organizations in the more immediate needs. We have also received support from the people in the diaspora. For example, we have an initiative from Berkeley, and it's called Barrio Solar. They have a website in Facebook that you also can go there and support the work that they are doing to provide solar power kits and gravity lights to rural communities. And we are the organization that distributing this among the people in Puerto Rico. We want to respond in a very holistic and integrated mode to the needs of women and families. And we want to 
to respond and probably uh, a way that we can receive some support it's in things that it's not like food and water that is important and still important but also we need like vitamins or essential oils to work with, with groups and as i said we are working with different needs that are changing very fast so we are planning from now and for two or three months six months one year because this is going to take long time so we know that probably because of the news people is very aware of what is happening right now but i want to make clear that it's going to need a support in a long term we have our website where we are trying to post what we are doing so if you want to help you can also uh, contact us or call us and definitely we can talk more about ways that people can help definitely we are not going back to where we were but we are going to a new place and that's what is important to construct this new place in a very sustainable way wow that's what we want thank you very much bilma thank you for all the work you're doing it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you and thank you for this opportunity That was just the portion of an invigorating 14-minute conversation with Vilma Gonzalez Castro. I'm going to post the complete one in our page, kpfaapprentice.org. Please check it out after the show. And that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Yeah.